good morning, everybody. Uh, this is uh, uh, the our lecture, uh, second to the last one. We have another lecture uh, planned for Wednesday, and then uh, our final test would be given on Friday, and that would be the end of the semester uh, in that case. So we are not going to waste our time. We are going to immediately share uh, the screen and uh, choose in that case a chapter uh, that will take up probably the two hours of the uh, session. And uh, uh, the chapter we choose for today is uh, on uh, one of the applications of uh, our course here, which has to do with energy use, uh, nuclear energy in particular, and uh, uh, global climatic uh, change. Uh, what we'd like to do is uh, uh, cover uh, different views that uh, people uh, debate about climatic variation, climatic change. It's not global warming anymore. It's climatic change or variation. And then uh, try to seek some kind of forget uh, all the different points of view and make uh, uh, our own uh, in that case. So in that case, uh, uh, the, uh, it is uh, increasingly being realized that uh, Climatic variation is the issue. It is the defining issue of the century. And if we uh, want to learn about uh, energy in general, we cannot ignore the topic. So all of us should be cognizant of the different points of view. Uh, uh, I'll show you some of uh, 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 our own work here in terms of uh, predicting uh, based on a model of the atmosphere, uh, how uh, the uh, any anthropogenic. Anthropogenic means here that effect from humans can have on the climate variation or climate uh, change. That's our own model. Uh, and uh, in addition, uh, we are going to address the issue. Suppose that uh, uh, it happens to humanity that uh, we are having a runaway uh, warming uh, effect. So uh, we suggest a nuclear, civil nuclear engineering solution uh, in which we can restore uh, the Earth to uh, sit a situation where uh, we have uh, a very mild uh, temperate climate that existed about 20 million years ago. And that would be using techniques of uh, uh, the nuclear civil engineering in that case. So our topic today would involve some uh, uh, interesting uh, of, uh, work of our own uh, on uh, what to expect uh, if uh, there is a heating effect of the atmosphere. And second, uh, if we have a runaway kind of a situation, uh, is there a solution that humans can have uh, in general? Uh, so the defining issue of the century now is global climatic change and variation. Uh, it is uh, being uh, increasingly realized that uh, the effects of the climatic change that is occurring uh, to us uh, is real somehow, and uh, that uh, that change could be caused by natural phenomena, uh, as well as uh, it could be also caused by humans. So uh, what is being caused by uh, humans, we can maybe uh, uh, modify it, uh, change our behavior, but what is caused by nature, maybe we cannot, we have to adapt to it uh, in general. Uh, it is uh, to be admitted that uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, is uh, as being suggested as a global cause for uh, global uh, climatic change is a very small amount of the atmosphere. It's only 0.04% of the Earth's atmosphere. So this is about 400 parts per million uh, compared with other gases, or you can say it's four molecules per 10,000 or one molecule per 2,500 molecules. So it's a very, very small component of the, uh, the atmosphere of the Earth. And some people suggest that it may not, it does not have the effect that people are attributing to it in terms of climatic change. They add to the argument that, oh, well, carbon dioxide is something good because it contributes to the uh, photosynthesis process that plants life uh, 
that produces oxygen for life on Earth is also contributing to. So let us uh, see, uh, I'll let you read more about the different uh, arguments, but uh, let's look at uh, the Earth as being a, a dynamic uh, climate. Uh, it has the climate on Earth, and we are not talking about weather, we are talking about climate. Uh, this is weather patterns over long periods of time. So if we look at the uh, past of the Earth all the way to five, uh, uh, 570 million uh, years ago, uh, the best knowledge that we have is that the Earth uh, has undergone periods of cooling and periods of heating, ranging from 12 degrees Celsius to 22 degrees Celsius. So this is a range of about 10 degrees. You could see here that uh, there are a warm period. It's usually followed by a cool period, a warm period, followed by a cool period, warm period, cool period, over uh, millions of years. So that is from the Cambrian to the Orsovigian to the Silurian. These are all uh, uh, geological ages to the Triassic, the Jurassic of the famous uh, 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 dinosaurs uh, uh, survival on Earth. And uh, uh, it seems that uh, right now we are uh, in a cool period and we are moving out of the cool period. So we are the, uh, at, the, at the bottom of the average uh, global temperature right now. Okay, so this is 570 million years in ge geological age of the Earth. So in fact, the Earth's temperature has varied uh, average-wise uh, over uh, uh, millions of years. If we take the only uh, few uh, thousand years in the past, 450,000 years, uh, the Earth, uh, this is 400,000 years ago or years before present, you would notice again the variation uh, was the average uh, uh, temperature varied between 20 degrees Celsius to about 38 or 40 degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit. In that case, that's Fahrenheit uh, uh, between <laughs> <coughs> glacial periods where the earth was very, very cold, glacial, 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 and then suddenly you'll find that there are periods of forming that come in uh, suddenly. So we we'll look at uh, more detail on that uh, graph uh, right uh, here. Uh, the earth emerged from the most richer uh, glacier period about 18,000 years ago uh, from the site of the University of Illinois here. Uh, we had a large uh, uh, glacier uh, forming the Muhammad type of, uh, 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 there was in fact a, a, a <clears throat> uh, we had 50 feet of uh, ice <laughs> uh, above our heads if you are sitting at the site of the University of uh, Illinois here in Jena. Okay, so this was over 400,000 years ago. Uh, I'll show you later uh, how we, we know about this. Uh, if you look at that uh, end of the last glacial period, uh, the temperature was uh, uh, of the Earth was 11 degrees Celsius. You find that uh, about uh, 18,000 years ago, the Earth warmed up, and uh, we have more detail about different uh, periods where uh, the Earth warmed up and then cooled and warmed up and then cooled. Uh, we have names for it. Uh, uh, very recently uh, in uh, Europe, uh, uh, there was a little ice age where the temperature of the Earth came in below that 15 degrees Celsius average. And uh, earlier in the medieval period, it was uh, warm. Supposedly, we are in a warm period right now. Uh, and uh, in the history of human migration, uh, it's very recent. It's no more than about uh, two thousand years uh, or three thousand, two thousand years uh, really before uh, present. Uh, at the time of the Roman Empire, they had a climate optimum. So the, uh, uh, the Roman Empire thrived with that in that uh, uh, warm period. And uh, it's designated as the Roman climate uh, uh, optimum. Before this uh, uh, cores of ice uh, in uh, uh, from the areas of the Antarctica in the South Pole. I'll show you more detail about it. And uh, you'll find that uh, from the cores of ice over 
the last uh, 450,000 years, we know uh, that the uh, uh, isotopic composition uh, at the, not the percent level, but at the mill or the 1000s uh, level suggested that the presence of the oxygen isotopes uh, in it can give us an idea about the temperature the, uh, of the Earth at that time. Uh, there were two climate optima, it's uh, called the Holocene uh, climate optima, where uh, the Earth was warm, but you could notice that uh, uh, the temperature has been varying at least uh, 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 in, uh, uh, f uh, as deduced from the, the ice cores that uh, have been uh, extracted over that long period of time in general. Uh, in 1816, <clears throat> uh, we have uh, detailed documentation about the, uh, uh, the, the, the Earth uh, being uh, uh, in a cold uh, period of time. So the climate of the Earth does vary, and uh, these are cycles that we don't have control on. One cycle that uh, we know does happen, uh, and we can uh, see it in our lifetime, uh, is a short-term short, a short -term cycle called El Niño-La Niña uh, uh, cycles. And uh, uh, we, we can observe this and uh, uh, humans over time have adapted to it. Oh, of course, an even shorter uh, climatic change is the seasons. We have, as humans, adapted to the seasons. We have adapted to the El Niño-La Niña side. So what is that El Niño-La Niña, El Niño, uh, in Spanish means a little baby. Uh, that's because it happens around the period of Christmas uh, off the coast of South America, uh, Peru and Chile. And uh, that's a little baby refers to the baby uh, Jesus. Uh, La Nina is a little girl. Uh, it's the opposite of uh, El Nino in terms of the temperatures of the ocean off the coast of South America. Uh, fishermen there observed it uh, when the uh, the uh, uh, period of El Nino occurs, you'll find that the temperature uh, of the ocean uh, uh, the, described by the oceanic uh, uh, Nino El Nino uh, index uh, increases uh, by several degrees. You could see here the peaks. Uh, and uh, when you get uh, cold uh, water off the coast of South America, uh, El Nino would be a, a warming, in fact. Uh, La Nina would be cooling. When there is a period of La Nina, the currents in the Pacific Ocean rise from the bottom to the surface and bring in a good catch of anchovies. So the fishermen were able to notice that when it is warm, uh, the catch of anchovies is little. You could see that uh, this is in fact a cycle of nature that we don't have control on to a large degree. So here it is. Uh, a description of the La, La, La Nina. La Nina changes the weather. Uh, you find that the Pacific jet stream affects our uh, west coast. Uh, the west coast uh, all the way to Alaska becomes cool. It displaces the polar jet stream, which is a current of air affecting, say, uh, North uh, America. So in that case, that's a short term cycle and uh, we have uh, no control uh, on it. Another short cycle, as I suggested, is the, uh, the seasons. And it has to do with the tilt uh, of the axis of rotation uh, of the Earth. Some people suggest that there was a collision that eventually may have formed the moon a long time ago. We can tell that the moon has the same composition as the rocks on the Earth. The tilting of the Earth by 23 and a half degrees uh, forms a season. So, uh, we get an equinox, uh, two equinoxes, one in March uh, 21st to 22nd, uh, one in September 22nd to 23rd. And then we have also two solstices. Uh, this is uh, the June 21st uh, of uh, year at each year and December 21st of uh, each uh, year. So in that case, the tilt uh, is the cause of the tilt of the rotation of the Earth when the sun radiation is more perpendicular on the Earth than the watts or the power flux, power per meter squared, watts per meter squared is higher uh, uh, in the upper hemisphere than in the lower hemisphere, and we have the seasons. There are other short-term effects that we don't have control on, or we don't have control on 
the tilt of the rotation of the Earth is the North Atlantic Oscillation uh, in general. So how do we know about those uh, effects? Uh, first, there is observation in 1347 to 1351. Uh, we had uh, a mini ice age. I'll show you some pictures uh, of uh, it and uh, uh, cooling and also 1940s, 1970s inspired a, glo a global cooling scale. They were not talking about global warming over that period. They were talking about uh, global cooling. Uh, <coughs> stories about an impending new little ice age with crop failures and famines. And that inspired the, the tale of uh, Hansel and Gretel, uh, the little ice age for families facing starvation to choose with, uh, to uh, choose uh, uh, of their children to abandon in the forest too, because they didn't have food to feed them. That's the tale of uh, Hansel and Gretel. Go and uh, look at it in your English kind of uh, classes uh, to stretch the food supply far enough for the rest of the family to survive the winter until spring. So they would take their children and leave them out uh, in the forest, abandon them basically. Uh, the bad weather confined weakened and malnourished families indoors in close quarters, increased the rodents population, well, mice and mice are vectors for uh, uh, fleas. Uh, and the fleas now, uh, uh, of course, spread uh, diseases like uh, typhus, as well as the black buponic plague pandemic that ravaged Europe over the period 1347 to 1351. Uh, scientists have been uh, uh, trying to study uh, uh, how is that uh, 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 temp how these temperature variations are occurring. So they measure the isotope of oxygen 18, uh, not oxygen 16, the most common isotope, but oxygen 16. Uh, uh, on the 1,000 uh, part per 1,000 level, per mil it's called, uh, or per thousand, uh, uh, mil is thousand in French. And uh, that variation of the oxygen 16 isotope is an indication uh, of the temperature uh, in uh, ice. And the ice has been forming and depositing itself in different parts of the world, like in Greenland, for instance. Uh, Greenland is a huge island. Uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, they went there and uh, drilled ice cores. I'll show you a picture of them. Measured that uh, uh, percentage of oxygen 16 over different layers of the ice and were able to determine the temperature variation of the Earth over uh, long periods of time. Uh, there are also some uh, studies that did not just use uh, oxygen 18, but they used deuterium, the isotope of hydrogen deuterium, they studied the methane concentration. And uh, most of the data that is available to us is from an area of Antarctica, uh, uh, an area called Fostock Lake. Uh, the ice there uh, is uh, about two miles in thickness. So imagine that you drill a hole two miles uh, in depth and you can get information up to 420,000 years. And uh, this data is available to everybody. So uh, I uh, went and tried to get those data and I'll show you the results. Uh, so Lake Fostock actually is a lake under the ice uh, and uh, the Fostock station here the, uh, 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 in Antarctica, uh, close to the South Pole uh, is 2.2 miles in depth. The motion of the ice on top of the, uh, the land there uh, creates heat. So there is a lake there that exists right really uh, under uh, the uh, ice. So the core of the ice can go up to 2.2 miles in uh, thickness and uh, you can access the data. So I went through the trouble, got the data, I put it through an Excel uh, 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 worksheet uh, up to the 425,000 years in the past uh, and uh, uh, plotted the uh, the temperature variation in degrees Celsius over the last 420,000 years from the ice cores at Lake Fostock. I give you the reference here in the data so you can uh, uh, do that, uh, create the plot all by yourself. Now, this is a plot that I created here and look at what happens in that case. You find that uh, <clears throat> there is a, a continuous decrease over 
about 100,000 years of the temperature of the earth and then suddenly it goes up and then it decreases again and then goes up. It decreases again and goes up. It decreases again and goes up and we are in a period here where we are in the up region uh, around the zero, which is uh, the average temperature uh, uh, of the earth uh, today. So uh, definitely there is here a, if you take that peak and that peak here, that's 350 to 250,000 years ago or before present. So there is a cycle of 100,000 years in the climate of the earth. And the temperature in that case varies say from uh, minus nine degrees to three degrees. So uh, about 11 degrees, at least in the area of uh, Antarctica. All right, so we can detect immediately here that there is a cycle of the temperature of the Earth, uh, not uh, related to humans. Humans did not exist <coughs> 150,000 years ago. Uh, uh, and uh, in that case, it has to do with basically the Earth's uh, uh, geography and climate in general uh, that is not anthropogenic in any way. So this is uh, related to the uh, basically the geology of the Earth in general. So there is uh, also another source of uh, data from uh, central uh, Green uh, Greenland ice cores that we can access, and they uh, are some kind of uh, uh, concur with the results from the Fostok Lake in uh, Antarctica. All right, so uh, it doesn't tell us much about that uh, other than that there is a 100,000 year cycle in uh, the uh, temperature variation on the Earth. So how about uh, taking it uh, to 50,000 years in the past? Now, notice something interesting here in the, uh, uh, the, the plot in Excel, that if you take uh, a linear averaging here, you notice that there is a very, very, very slight decrease in the temperature of the Earth. So we can say that over the 420,000 years, there was some cooling. Uh, of the Earth to, to a fraction of a degree. So it's really within uh, the uh, measurement errors probably. But let's look at uh, uh, some that area right here in the last 50,000 uh, years or so uh, in terms of the temperature of the Earth. And uh, here it is plotted. Uh, I plotted it myself. And you can do that yourself for the fun of it. You notice that there is still variation there but uh, if you put it into a least square linear fit in Excel, uh, you find that it's not a decrease anymore. It is definitely some form of a more prominent uh, increase in the uh, temperature of the Earth up to the present time. That was 50,000 years ago. How about uh, lately? Let's uh, uh, look uh, at the higher resolution of the data. And in that case, let's plot the temperature of the Earth uh, this is also, uh, you can do that yourself. I've done it uh, myself here. Uh, the temperature of the Earth in 0.5 or uh, multiplied by uh, 1,000 years before present. So uh, this is um, uh, 500 years before uh, present. You'll find definitely an increase in the temperature of the Earth. And uh, in 200 years before present, right here, 0.2 multiplied by 1,000, you find a definite sudden increase. Uh, people refer to that sudden increase as the <clears throat> hockey uh, 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 hockey stick. Uh, it looks like a hockey uh, uh, handle for people who play hockey. And definitely the least uh, square linear interpolation shows a 0 0.2, 0 0.2 decrease uh, uh, in uh, in, in temperature. So the hockey stick curve is shown uh, right here. Now, 200 years uh, corresponds to uh, the uh, onset of the Industrial Revolution. So uh, what is uh, typical of the Industrial Revolution is, uh, of course, uh, the steam engine uh, invented by Watt. And uh, definitely, uh, uh, this is the ascent of our current uh, technological Civilization. So people, uh, the scientists immediately establish a correlation between the industrial revolution uh, and the onset of that hockey uh, stick. So it is uh, some kind of uh, sobering to, to see that, that there is definitely 
a decrease. And uh, the gentleman uh, is, uh, who uh, talked about the hockey stick curve is uh, named Mon. You can go to the reference list and you can get more information about that data in general. All right, so there are uh, variations in the temperature of the Earth that uh, <clears throat> date back to our, at least to our knowledge to from the geologic, geological data that we have and the anthropological data uh, <clears throat> uh, to up to 420 thousand years in the past. People tried to find uh, explanations for these variations in the temperature of the earth. And uh, a scientist uh, uh, named Milankovic <clears throat> uh, attributed it to uh, variations uh, in uh, the, the climatic change in that case, uh, but uh, attributed it to the radiation balance of the earth and the sun. And uh, he attributed it to four different uh, variations, two different causes. Uh, one is a change in the incoming solar radiation. Uh, another one uh, uh, related to the change in the fraction of solar radiation that is reflected or what's called the albedo, like the mirror, uh, uh, light reflects off a mirror. And uh, when the surface of the earth is white, there is more reflection than when it is uh, black. And uh, uh, this is also attributed to the presence of aerosols like dust from volcanic eruptions, for instance, or uh, dust uh, uh, from uh, smoke from burning fossil fuels like coal or wood. Uh, he attributed it to a third reason, the, an alteration to the long wave energy radiated back to space uh, and uh, uh, definitely the idea of greenhouse gas concentration. Notice that greenhouses is not just carbon dioxide. In fact, uh, if you think about uh, uh, water or, or uh, <clears throat> uh, evaporated water in the air, this vapor, uh, water vapor is a way that uh, uh, basically is a greenhouse gas. And there are other greenhouse gases like methane and nitrogen oxides in general. Uh, he also suggested that local climate depends on how heat is distributed by the winds and ocean uh, currents. Uh, these are designated as the Milanko witch cycles. Uh, the first one uh, is attributed to the uh, eccentricity of the rotation of the Earth around our star, uh, the Sun. And uh, you'll find that uh, here shown in a diagram, uh, the Earth. Uh, uh, before I go further, here is a picture of Mr. Milankovic. Uh, uh, and uh, he attributed the variation uh, of temperatures that we have seen uh, to first the eccentricity of the Earth. The, uh, the, the rotation of the Earth around the sun is not an exact ellipse. It's some kind, it can be closer or it could be uh, farther away from the sun. And he suggested that that cycle is, uh, leads to a cycle in the temperature of the Earth of 100,000 years. And that is supported by our own uh, uh, graph that uh, I have shown you uh, a little while ago in that definitely, uh, according to the ice cores from uh, Lake Fashtok in Antarctica, uh, definitely there is a 100,000 year cycle that we can observe if we, of course, believe the uh, the, the data from those uh, uh, ice cores at Faustock. Here it is, uh, the diagram that I have shown you. Uh, so that 100,000 years cycle uh, is somehow related according to Milankovic to the eccentricity uh, of the Earth's rotation around uh, the sun. He also attributed to uh, uh, discuss another cycle. He calls it not the eccentricity cycle, but he called it the obliquity cycle. This is, has to do with the tilt of, now that the tilt here of the Earth's rotational uh, axis, uh, right now, as we suggested, 23 and a half degrees. And he suggested that the Earth makes a total rotation uh, with a cycle of 41,000 years. And uh, he suggested also the third cycle has to do with the precession of the equinoxes, uh, that we discussed earlier that control the seasons. Uh, this is the direction of the Earth's axis of rotation itself. So here it is at uh, the uh, variation of the publicity uh, of the cycle and the 
In that case, there is another cycle that uh, lasts uh, 19,000 to 20,000 year uh, period. <clears throat> now, uh, not a single cycle happens at one time. You'll find that these are now three cycles superimposed on each other. And uh, according to Milankovic, <clears throat> uh, he thinks that this is the most significant drivers of the ice ages. And when combined, they are named as the Milankovic cycle. Uh, people who deny any effects of humans on the Earth's climate, of course, uh, suggest that uh, we cannot uh, have no uh, humans are not affecting the uh, climate. Uh, it really has to do with uh, cycles of the uh, uh, <clears throat> relationship between the Earth uh, rotating around its star, the Sun. And the Earth, in terms of volume compared to the Sun, is uh, really very tiny. It's a one millionth the size of the sun, but it is affected by that rotation. Here is the uh, Earth inclination uh, cycle. Uh, it uh, simply is that that rotation around the tilt of the Earth itself has a cycle of uh, 41,000 years between 22 and a half degrees. And then it changes, comes uh, uh, a little higher here to uh, 24 degrees. Uh, the precession cycle, uh, is 24, uh, 20,000 to 4,000 years. And uh, that is uh, also between 22 and a half degrees and 24 uh, degrees. Uh, there is eccentricity of the orbit uh, of the rotation of the Earth around the sun. When it's closest to the sun, uh, the location is called the perihelion and uh, in the ellipse kind of rotation. And when it's far away from the sun, it's called the aphelion. Right now, uh, so in that case, uh, we really have uh, occurrence of a uh, 100,000 year cycle, uh, another 41 year cycle, a 29 year, thousand year cycle, 23,000 year cycle, 19,000 year cycle. This is in French, densité, spectral, spectral density. So uh, it describes the cycles per million years, million d'années, année in French is per year. So the 100,000 cycles happens uh, 10 times every million years. The 41 cycle happens 20 times every uh, million years. The 29,000, 23,000 occurs 40 times every, uh, uh, every 20, uh, uh, the 23,000, uh, 40 times about, uh, around 20 times every 20,000 to 23,000 years. And those cycles are superimposed on each other as uh, we'll show at the end of the lecture, how people study the combination of the cycles that can come up with predictions of uh, where we are headed into our uh, climate. Uh, notice that uh, these effects <clears throat> are real. Uh, they have to do with the fact that uh, the rotation of the Earth uh, around the sun is not at the exact uh, ellipse, uh, both the sun and the Earth <clears throat> rotate around the center of the Earth's mass system. So in that case, it's slightly not uh, uh, the center because the sun is much larger than the Earth. Obviously, it's closer to the sun than it is to the Earth. And notice that the Earth's orbit is 1.5, uh, 10 to the eight. So it's uh, uh, <clears throat> 150 million kilometers from our star, uh, the sun uh, in general. There are other uh, climatic variations that uh, drive the uh, uh, cycles of climate uh, uh, in the Earth. Uh, volcanoes can affect the climate by emitting aerosols. Uh, aerosols meaning dust, basically. Millions of dusts of Earth, uh, when volcanoes erupt, are uh, uh, ejected into the upper atmosphere. Uh, they also contain sulfur dioxide and uh, uh, carbon dioxide too, as well as steam. And we know that uh, steam water is a greenhouse effect, uh, has a greenhouse effect in that it heats the earth, the carbon dioxide heat the earth. But when uh, other gases are released like sulfur dioxide and the aerosols, they shield the earth's surface and they have a negative effect on the temperature of the earth. So, and we cannot really control uh, the volcanoes uh, uh, in that case. Let's uh, study in particular, scientists think that CO2, the release of carbon dioxide is uh, uh, a primary uh, 
uh, driver in the change in the uh, cycles uh, uh, of Milankovic. Uh, there is another cycle that uh, we have to take into account, uh, which is the solar energy uh, output. And uh, that cycle has been observed a very long time ago uh, by uh, 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 astronomers from China. And uh, here is uh, a picture of uh, uh, a middle-aged scientist. Uh, 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 the Chinese uh, observed this uh, sunspots uh, uh, in 28 BC. Uh, Mr. Uh, Thomas Harriot, shown in that picture here, reported those sun cycles uh, around, uh, let's see here, uh, <clears throat> well, in the Middle Ages, I don't remember what year exactly. And uh, you'll find that uh, uh, he wrote reports about the sun cycles here, spots that you see uh, when the sun is active. Notice uh, something interesting here that I'll describe to you. Very few people notice it in that they occur, the sunspots occur in pairs. You see here, two dots, two dots, two dots, uh, three dots here, but two dots back here uh, again. And this is another cycle that uh, basically humans have adapted to, uh, but they have no control on it because as I'll show you in a moment, uh, people think that it has to do with the uh, inversion of the uh, <clears throat> so, uh, south and north pole magnetic poles of the sun. Uh, that was also reported by uh, Galileo Galilei in 1609 after he uh, uh, invented the telescope. Uh, he reported about the solar uh, sunspots that occur when the sun is active. And uh, at some point, uh, those uh, sunspots uh, increase in number and then they decrease in number with a cycle of 11 years. If you take half a cycle, the whole cycle takes 22 uh, years. Uh, those uh, uh, two spots, uh, the two spots occurrence of the sunspots is attributed that uh, to uh, the magnetic field of uh, the sun uh, emerging out of the corona. The corona is the area around the sun where the fusion reactions do occur. And then you find that the magnetic field lines act like rubber bands. So they jump out from one spot and re-enter, or uh, they jump out from this spot maybe, uh, follow the arrow and they deposit, uh, come back to the surface of the sun back at another point. So they appear basically the cold parts uh, that uh, of the magnetic field uh, appear as always as a pair. That explains the pair production. Now, why is it uh, that the, uh, the solar spots occur? This is a period where the sun is mostly active depending on the position of its north and south poles. And uh, that diagram shows that the north and south pole on the sun, uh, some kind of change from being north to south and south to north. And uh, in the change process, because it's a cycle, you reach a point where the activity of the energy release from the sun is a minimum, and then it goes back to a maximum. And that is a solar cycle. And this is an actual picture of the prominences here that uh, erect, uh, move out of the sun surface when the sun is active, you could see that the magnetic field goes from one point and then re-enters at another point. So the sunspots appear in pairs. And these are huge in size. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, an artist. This is an actual picture of the sun, obviously, but this is an artist's depiction of what is the size of the Earth. It's those uh, solar flares or uh, ejections that I mentioned in the chapter on their effects on electrical and nuclear installations. Uh, nuclear reactors in that case, power reactors, you could see that uh, the Earth uh, is a very, very tiny uh, piece, uh, nice, beautiful ball uh, in space. That diagram suggests that basically the uh, magnetic field of the, uh, of the sun reverses itself. The North Pole here becomes the South Pole here. In the process of re inversion, uh, you go from a maximum activity uh, of the uh, sun, uh, uh, the, the solar reactions to a zero here when it is at an angle, and then it reappears back again uh, as a, a maximum. So this is definitely another cycle of nature uh, happening in the 
uh, corona aspect of the sun. And uh, uh, over 11 years, uh, the cycle goes up and then comes down. And then the whole thing is reversed back again in another year. So it ends up as a 22 years uh, cycle. And this uh, happens in the convection layers of the sun in its 22 uh, sun cycle. Obviously, this is uh, something that comes from nature. We have no control on it, but uh, humans have adapted to it. Like we adapted to the seasons, we adapted to the El Nino, La Nina. We uh, adapted also to the solar magnetic activity 22 year cycle. So when it is, uh, 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 if there is a climatic change that has to do with uh, uh, the uh, geography or geology, if you want to call it, uh, then, uh, of course, uh, uh, all we ha can do is uh, 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 adapt to it and change our uh, behavior. Uh, this is a graph that shows us uh, sunspots uh, activity uh, of the sun. And uh, when the uh, sunspots are at a maximum, uh, the cosmic radiation that comes to us from all parts of space uh, becomes uh, negatively correlated. It's a minimum right here. You could see here. When you have very large sunspot activity, we get less cosmic rays. Why is this? Uh, this is suggested to be related to the strength of the magnetic field of the sun. When the magnetic field of the sun here, when the sun is very active, it protects the earth from the impinging of cosmic rays on the earth. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, cosmic rays are particles of high energy uh, and uh, they, <laughs> <laughs> interact with the uh, atmosphere uh, of uh, the Earth. When we have a large uh, instance to, of uh, uh, cosmic rays here, when the sun is not very active, the Earth is not protected from the impinging of the cosmic rays. It has been observed that uh, 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 cosmic rays acts as nucleation sites, so uh, raindrops form about it, so you find that the intensity of storms is higher uh, when uh, the sun is not uh, very active uh, and uh, the solar cycle definitely affects the climate on the earth. And it has to, it is suggested that it has to do with how the magnetic field of the earth affects the, uh, the cosmic radiation reaching the earth's uh, uh, cycle. So in, the, in fact, you find that uh, cosmic rays uh, here uh, shown uh, 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 on the lower diagram, when you are, the cosmic rays are at the maximum, uh, this corresponds to a low uh, intensity of the solar uh, cycle. So definitely uh, the solar cycle affects the climate uh, on uh, the Earth. All right, you can look at the nuclear reactions that happen uh, uh, as a result of these cosmic rays impinging on the Earth's surface, but uh, uh, people have been, uh, uh, observing and recording the occurrence of the solar cycles up to beginning from uh, the year 1750. You notice here the solar cycle up and then down and up and then down. And if you look at the, uh, the peaks from 1800 to 1811, that's 11 years, a total cycle of uh, uh, after the uh, flipping of the, uh, the poles of the sun as it is understood, uh, takes from say 1800 to 1821, uh, 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 and that is a, a 22 uh, year uh, cycle. Uh, we are entering today uh, the 25th cycle that humans have been uh, observing. And uh, uh, around 2010, we were at a minimum of the solar cycle and we are increasing to a new maximum. The solar activity is going uh, up. So this is. Uh, we have, as humans, uh, observation from NASA and uh, Nation National Aer uh, Aeronautics and Space Administration, NOAA, uh, National, uh, uh, now that's Oceanic and uh, Aerospace also Administration. Uh, from 1640 to 1700, you find that we have observations of the sunspot observations uh, uh, at, our, uh, at our hand. And uh, uh, it is divided into periods, like uh, we had a minimum around 18, the 1800s. Uh, this is called the Dalton minimum. And uh, there was an earlier lower minimum uh, that generated what was called in Europe, the mini ice age, uh, the 
water of the river Thames in uh, uh, England basically froze. <laughs> it became icy. It affected crop production all over the world. There were famines. Uh, people could not uh, produce enough food for their sustenance. The Maunder minimum uh, uh, is the one that happened from 1650 to 1700. It has, it was related to the sunspot activity. Uh, a lower minimum is a Dalton minimum happening around 1800. Another lower minimum, it's called the Glassberg minimum, happened around 1900. Right now we have a, a modern, uh, we have had a modern maximum, uh, but uh, people who study these uh, events suggest that uh, make basically uh, uh, predictions that you might reach another Maunder minimum uh, uh, by the year 2050 and that that could cause a mini ice age. Uh oh, what are we talking about here? We are talking not about global warming, we are talking about uh, mini ice age, global cooling. So these are the effects, of course, of the sun activity. We have no control on it. And we need simply to adapt to it. However, we have control on uh, other effects, like uh, when we release particulates from burning fossil fuel to the atmosphere, that is under our control. Uh, but it does change the climate. And the, uh, uh, the uh, debate that is uh, going on is whether uh, we cannot uh, affect the climate, because this is a, an effect that comes from basically uh, the sun and the uh, uh, and uh, the Earth and its stars, the sun uh, interactions, we have no control on this uh, events. Uh, and people who say, no, we do have some kind of a control on these events uh, by the burning of fossil fuel and the debate goes on. So in that case, we need to study the different points of view, uh, forget about what people tell us and each one of us making their own uh, opinion in general. Uh, this uh, has to do with the uh, geomagnetic index since 1844. <clears throat> the recent in, uh, 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 measurements suggest that the geomagnetic activity of the sun is decreasing, uh, so that we are getting into a dimming rather than a warming period. Wow, uh, it's not global warming, it's global cooling right there. And uh, again, we have to adapt to it. Uh, this is a space weather uh, uh, prediction, and uh, you can access the sites uh, by NOAA and NASA, which uh, uh, in fact uh, uh, do some uh, prediction of the weather by actual observations. Let me stop here for a little while and show you how you can where and how you can access these uh, sites. Uh, it's uh, great fun, not just to. Uh, uh, listen to the weather forecast on your TV, but go, go to the NASA site and uh, the NOAA site and uh, watch the space weather. I have links here uh, on the uh, portal to our uh, web page. And uh, let me see here. Uh, this is a site where you can observe space weather. And this is the site for the uh, sunspot numbers. Remember? Uh, these uh, spot numbers are shown here, uh, and uh, basically daily, on a daily basis, uh, uh, starting say from the year 2010, we are in 2022. So this is uh, really uh, the actual, uh, 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 actual observations uh, right now. Uh, on a monthly basis, you could see that in 2020, we reached a very low period of activity of the sun from the, uh, the sun activity. And we are in 2022, now it is increasing. Uh, the prediction uh, is that it would reach a maximum around 2025 here. And then, oh, hopefully it will come back again. But that is something that uh, uh, is uh, in fact a reality of our uh, uh, life here on Earth. And uh, another interesting uh, space weather that you can watch is the galactic cosmic uh, rays uh, neutron counter. And on a daily basis, again, you can see that at that point here, we had a, uh, it's called the Ulu data uh, site in, uh, I think it's uh, Finland. Uh, and uh, uh, you find that here at that point here in 2011, there was a maximum in the neutron flux, meaning that the X-rays, uh, the cosmic rays uh, interacting with the Earth climate were generating 
those neutrons it came to a minimum it's uh, has increased and then it's coming back down uh, again in the last 30 days it has been uh, increasing another interesting site for uh, uh, space uh, uh, weather is uh, the sunspot number galactic x-rays the space weather here this tells us whether there is a solar activity and uh, that's very important for us because of course uh, 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 if we get uh, mass ejection from the sun it can affect our uh, uh, power stations and the operation of our of all electrical system nuclear or otherwise and it's described by what's called the k sub p index uh, you notice that uh, here uh, in fact that's august first here uh, there was some kind of a peak uh, in the flare classes on the sun but it decreases uh, decreased back again and uh, uh, we are august first so these are actual uh, observations uh, ongoing right now so you can have a uh, uh, fun uh, watching that type of uh, uh, information uh, watching the space weather in the same way that you could uh, watch the uh, the the just the the uh, the daily weather uh, uh, normal weather not space weather earth weather forecasts uh, in general let me see here i am in the wrong uh, uh, place i have to find my way back Uh, it seems that uh, we have a problem with the internet here. Okay, so we you could see here that uh, space weather is uh, uh, being observed and uh, classified and predicted because of the, uh, and this is again, uh, daily observations that are being fitted to uh, a curve and uh, from there we can get predictions on uh, how to uh, deal with it uh, this is the last graph that i have shown you uh, this is uh, an observation uh, on uh, on july uh, 2nd uh, 2021 Ob obviously i've shown you the diagram that is for today it has progressed even uh, more than that so it is uh, 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 being observed in general uh, we are right now at the cycle 25 uh, from the days that we started observing uh, the sun. Uh, in 2020, we reached a maximum, a minimum, and uh, this is the predictions of the ranges for the cycle 2025. So indeed, when people say that, oh, the climate change has to do with uh, the interaction of the sun with uh, uh, the earth, with its star, uh, the sun, uh, then they are right. That is true uh, to a certain uh, extent. Uh, and uh, we cannot have no control on uh, this cycle. Uh, but in fact, uh, you'll see later that uh, we also have effects that we have control on and uh, in the release of carbon dioxide and uh, uh, the release of sulfur dioxide and so on. Uh, this uh, predictions that go, the, uh, the, that's a NASA prediction for the solar cycle 25. They suggest that it is going to be uh, reach a maximum in 2025, three years from today, <laughs> from now, and that it would be a peak, uh, a peak that is uh, cooler uh, than uh, previous uh, uh, cycles. Uh, we are we are we have emerged from a modern maximum into more or less a, a normal kind of a system, but they do not predict a modern minimum. Uh, or a Dalton minimum, where we would have a mini ice age in uh, Europe. And uh, this is our actual pictures of the sun activity when uh, the sun is at a minimum of its cycle. You don't see any of those sunspots. Uh, and uh, that happened in 2008 and 2019. And uh, this is uh, basically the what you see when the sun is very active and the sunspots again see here they occur in uh, in pairs pairs of them and i suggested 
that it has to do with the rubber bands uh, uh, forming into the magnetic field of uh, the sun uh, in general. Obviously, we have no control on these, so uh, that is the point of view that we have no control on the web. These observations are uh, carried out by uh, dedicated people who watch the space weather uh, through satellites uh, that are observing the activity of our wonderful star, the sun. Without it, we don't have life on Earth uh, in general. This is a SOHO satellite uh, that uh, observes the sun from its deep core to the outer corona. The corona is the surface of the sun where most of the nuclear reactions, the fusion reactions occur and observes a solar wind. And as I suggested, uh, those sites uh, of space weather can be accessed by anybody uh, who have the uh, interest uh, in doing it. Uh, as I suggested, uh, the solar cycle can have a minima. Uh, the Maunder minimum, as they have shown, can be very cool and the delta node be oh, a little uh, cool, but not as uh, seriously cool as the Maunder minimum. And uh, these are actual uh, uh, paintings that uh, uh, we find in the literature about people uh, having fun on uh, the river Thames uh, in uh, London, uh, simply having boats and pulling them. And uh, here you could see that uh, this is during the, uh, uh, not the Maunder, but the, the, uh, the uh, Dalton minimum here, they are ice skating and uh, having uh, basically, uh, they're just enjoying their weekends on this frozen surface of the uh, uh, river Thames in London. And that was uh, still the beginning of the industrial revolution. So they didn't have to probably to do much with the releases of CO2. Notice that uh, the Little Ice Age have had an interpretation that it had to do with the volcanic uh, uh, eruptions. Erup uh, volcanic eruptions can uh, cause the release of uh, particulate matter, dust basically into the atmosphere, shield the surface of the earth from solar radiation and uh, uh, but uh, uh, according to Milan, which we have also the solar cycles uh, in, in general. There is a connection between the ultraviolet radiation that reaches us uh, from uh, the sun and the solar cycles. Uh, as you know, that uh, radiation from the sun is emitted in the visible range. That's what we see with our eyes. In the infrared range, that's what we feel with our skin. And in the ultraviolet that we don't see, but some other animals like bees, for instance, can see the ultraviolet radiation depending on the uh, uh, activity of the solar uh, events in the corona in general. So in fact, uh, there are global warming and cooling trends that are geographical in nature that uh, humans do not have control on. All right, so however, uh, 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 and in fact, uh, the Earth is in a situation where uh, it, we have a balanced uh, partial greenhouse effect. Without it, uh, the Earth's climate would be very cool, like uh, the temperature on Mars and uh, life uh, may not have been even possible. So we have what's called the Goldilocks effect uh, in, uh, uh, in action, where our distance from the sun provides the Earth with water that is not all in the icy ice stage, but in the water, liquid water stage. And this is the, a basis for life on Earth uh, in general. If you take Venus, uh, uh, Venus is known to have uh, an atmosphere that have primarily CO2. Uh, and on Venus, the temperature is so high from a runaway uh, effect of the presence of CO2, uh, uh, a heating effect. Uh, to the point that uh, the Russians uh, sent a satellite to uh, Venus, uh, landed it, uh, it operated for uh, a few hours, and then uh, uh, basically because the temperature on the surface of Venus is uh, about uh, 400 degrees Fahrenheit, that is enough to melt uh, lead. So the satellite kept sending uh, uh, signals and then stopped operating because it, it melted out maybe in general. So in, uh, on uh, Venus, uh, uh, we uh, know that we have a runaway greenhouse effect. And this is uh, what worries people who suggest that uh, if we uh, 
uh, reach conditions like on Venus intentionally by anthropogenic, by uh, made by humans, uh, we can get a greenhouse, uh, a runaway greenhouse uh, effect. By how much uh, is the effect? So let's uh, look a little uh, quantitatively at what's called the infrared forcing. Uh, this is the power flux in watts per meter square attributed to CO2. Uh, uh, basically, a gentleman by the name of Mayer, so it's called the Mayer infrared forcing. Uh, the forcing in watts per meter square, the power uh, uh, per meter square per unit area uh, on the surface, uh, uh, he suggests it has to do with that CO2 concentration uh, that like uh, happens, uh, is happening according to uh, uh, human effects on Earth. He takes uh, a constant 5.35, the natural logarithm of the ending CO2 concentration in parts per million, uh, divided into the starting CO2 concentration in parts per million. So if you double the concentration of CO2, this becomes a ratio here of log natural logarithm of two, that's 0 0.6931 multiplied to 5.5. You'll find that if you double the CO2 concentration or Earth, you find that you're, uh, you, you would have a doubling of uh, the uh, infrared, forcing infrared has to do with heat, obviously. Uh, of uh, 3.7 watts per meter square. Now, if we say that at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere was 280 parts per million in the denominator, and uh, say we are uh, increased it to the level of 400 parts per million. So if you take 400 divided into 280, multiply, uh, take the natural logarithm uh, and multiply by 5.35, you find that the present day concentration is leading to an infrared forcing of 1.91 watts per centimeter uh, square. So that suggests that if you take that 1.91 divided into the doubling effect, uh, you'll find that uh, half of the forcing towards the CO2 doubling from the pre-industrial age level has already been achieved here on Earth. And according to the international body, of scientists studying climate, the International Panel on Climate Change, uh, basically that could lead, that would be uh, leading to an increase in the temperature of the Earth of 0.6 uh, with an error of plus or minus 0.2 degrees Celsius. So the implied sensitivity as it's called of the Earth's climate is that uh, in that case, we have increased the temperature of the Earth of uh, uh, by 1.2 degrees Celsius. And we'll come back to that number of uh, limiting the CO2 releases in the atmosphere uh, so as not to cause a runaway CO2 uh, uh, heating effect uh, like on the surface of Mars. Uh, the discussions about cl climatic change is that it has uh, uh, sub uh, supposedly uh, people are talking about CO2 effects of warming what some people are talking about sulfur dioxide, which would cool the atmosphere rather than warming it. So we have basically uh, different drivers for uh, the CO2 concentrations on the earth. And these are designated as the radiative forcing. It is suggested that CO2 with an error bar right here, uh, basically can uh, contribute to a positive effect on the uh, warming of the Earth, so does uh, halocarbons as well and methane, CH4, and uh, even the ozone in the upper atmosphere. Uh, uh, this have a positive forcing up to about one, well, maybe uh, 1.5 to two degrees uh, Celsius. So that is a total uh, net anthropogenic effect. Uh, there are now negative effects, negative forcings. Uh, the surface arvido of the Earth uh, reflects back solar radiation and uh, the aerosols, uh, dust from uh, pollution, actually from burning maybe fossil fuels like coal, uh, and uh, as well as clouds, uh, uh, have a negative effect. And uh, if we release sulfur dioxide, that will also have a negative effect not taken into account here. So here we are facing a total anthropogenic uh, radiative forcing of uh, about 1.5 watts per meter squared. 
that is definitely overcomes the negative effects of uh, the surface albedo and uh, cloud albedo. Notice, uh, let's stay with that albedo of the uh, clouds because we'll come back to it. So we can cool the earth, in fact, by generating more clouds in the atmosphere. Uh, the effects, of course, of uh, cosmic radiation uh, reaching the earth at times uh, or period of the low solar activity would uh, uh, enhance cloud formation and reduce the uh, effect of uh, it, be it becomes a, a negative forcing, meaning that it cools the Earth's surface. Uh, the effects uh, can be uh, affect human uh, life to a, a great degree, like uh, in a period of uh, heating uh, where uh, droughts occur, you find that this is associated with dust storms. And this is the a period here in the United States uh, where uh, dust storms uh, happen during the dust bowl climate uh, that will happen in 1935 in the United States Great Plains. We may be facing a similar situation that you can research yourself uh, uh, in uh, California. The aquifers there and the water in Lake Mead uh, is coming down, affecting, of course, the supply of water to large cities like Las Vegas and uh, Los Angeles. Uh, in that case, it can affect human life to a very deleterious effect. Uh, this is a dust storm that uh, happened, uh, has been happening in Australia, you could see in 2009. So it is uh, uh, the climate variations here can affect human life to a great degree, not just during the dust bowl. So what are the possible extinctions if we have a runaway uh, kind of uh, uh, greenhouse effect? Uh, we can have species extinctions. Many scientists in the biology field are studying that uh, process. Uh, we can have reduced food production as a temperature increase in some agricultural production region is le leading to a drop in crop yields. Uh, we do in fact have droughts in the Middle East and that is causing a migration of people trying to reach uh, Europe. Uh, uh, you can have uh, higher food prices. Uh, uh, you can have, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, when droughts happen in the Middle East, uh, uh, people start fighting about resources and uh, land use. And in that case, uh, civil wars erupt and then the civil wars uh, evolve into uh, more national wars and uh, uh, people get bombed out of their homes and uh, it affects human migration and uh, uh, people basically, people lives are affected. Uh, you can have modified stone patterns and I'll emphasize this uh, in our own work here, I'll show you how uh, the, uh, uh, what the effect on storm patterns. Uh, you can have oceanic disruptions. Uh, you can have flooding of uh, low-lying areas. Uh oh, this is happening in, in the just uh, latest weeks. The global warming is putting more moisture in the atmosphere. And uh, when uh, events of rain or storms happen, uh, tremendous amounts of rain uh, fall down. And in that case, they also can wash up the topsoil uh, which affects uh, food production uh, in general. So in fact, uh, uh, suggestions are that uh, uh, warming of the climate may be also caused through anthropogenic effects. It's not just uh, geography or cosmology, but uh, humans are uh, as a species affecting uh, right now uh, the earth climate. And uh, uh, these are pictures from 1932 to 1988. Uh, this is a nice cave that people here, as you could see them, were visiting. Look at that peak of a mountain here, a mountain here, a mountain here. So it says now uh, in 1988 that ice cave is not there anymore. So there is definitely a warming effect that melted that ice cage. This is a glacier. Uh, 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 this is in the United States, in Montana, uh, the Glacier National Park. This is uh, another picture in uh, Switzerland. Uh, the triant uh, 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 glacial, uh, a glacier is really a river of ice. It's ice from the mountains moving uh, uh, towards the, from the mountains area to the valley areas. And you could see here that glacier, again, look at this mountain here, the peak here and the peak here, the peak here and the peak there. Uh, from 1891 to 2019, the glacier is uh, disappearing. So in fact, there are observations that uh, we can see about 
the warming of the Earth's uh, atmosphere. Uh, this is uh, Antarctica. Uh, it has an ice shelf, a huge ice shelf within 30 days. That ice shelf here, uh, shown here, has simply totally shattered. Uh, this is a NASA photograph from uh, 2000, and this is attributed to global uh, warming. Uh, the glaciers in Greenland uh, also are retreating uh, in general. Uh, the worry is that uh, people worry about the stability of the North Atlantic current and about the temperature in the upper uh, atmosphere. Now, let us think about uh, how the temperature on the Earth is distributed around the Earth. And uh, the Earth's uh, temperature uh, is, of course, absorbed by uh, the water masses. Notice that 70% of the surface of the Earth is water. and uh, there are currents uh, in the Earth moving from the equatorial areas to the non-equatorial areas. Uh, the water in the oceans affect climate all over the Earth because uh, there is an exchange of temperature, ex uh, heat exchange between the energy absorbed by the water in the oceans and the land masses. And uh, uh, the differential in temperature between the equator and the cold parts of the oceans on Earth uh, has generated what we call the circumglobal equatorial uh, current. Uh, when it is red in color here, this means it's warm. You could see here, uh, it is warming in the Pacific region going above Australia, the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic, and coming to the area of Florida here, and the Gulf of Mexico, and then turning around and moving northward. And then now the water has cooled. Uh, uh, there is melting of the glaciers uh, in Greenland, uh, cold water. So you'll find that that water sinks to the bottom now. It has cooled and returns back again. And that cycle takes 100 years to occur. Another uh, depiction of that uh, cycle is uh, 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 a cool subsurface flow and a warm uh, uh, oversurface warmth. Uh, the fact uh, that if you look at uh, the position of Europe uh, on latitude compared to Canada, you find that uh, the, uh, the UK and Sweden and Finland are all at the level of Canada, which if you visit Canada at Montreal, for instance, you'll find that people move from one building to another in tunnels underground because it's extremely cold. Yet uh, you'll find that the UK is warm and that has to do with the fact that that uh, uh, equatorial current warms uh, Europe. And uh, without that equatorial current warming Europe, uh, Europe would be in an ice age. And you'll find that the Europeans are very worried about climatic change more than the Americans. Uh, the normal European thinks about his carbon imprint, whereas in the United States, people do not even think uh, about it because of the possibility if that current here that warms Europe stops uh, uh, carrying energy from the Caribbean area here and the Atlantic to Europe, uh, Europe would be at the same level as northern Canada, that would be into an ice age. And the migration from northern Africa and the Middle East to Europe would be reversed. The Europeans would find themselves going uh, back, to, uh, 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 reversing the mig human migration from Europe to uh, North uh, Africa. This is the situation today uh, with the uh, uh, Earth's climate. But that was not the case 30 million years ago. Uh, this is the best knowledge that we have about 30 million years ago. Uh, uh, the current, uh, the circumglobal current was uh, flowing from the Atlantic around the area of the Isthmus of Panama uh, to the Atlantic. And the distribution of uh, heat from the sun on the Earth's surface was very, uh, uh, some kind of, uh, uh, in a better position. Uh, in such a way that 30 million years ago, Antarctica, which is solid land, as we all know, was not covered with those 2.2 miles of ice at Lake Fashta. In addition, the uh, Arctic Ocean was open water. The Earth enjoyed a very mild uh, temperate uh, climate. So the suggestion is that, uh, well, if we find a way uh, of uh, 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 creating the conditions that existed 30 million years ago, uh, then we might overcome a runaway, a runaway situation uh, that can destroy life on Earth uh, and can become an extinction event 
uh, like what, what we know happens on Venus. So in that case, we'll learn from what happens uh, on Venus. These are the other pictures uh, uh, documenting the fact that indeed there is uh, uh, global warming here. That's, uh, 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 that's uh, Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. And you could see the ice cap there has been reduced uh, uh, from 1993 here to uh, the year 2000. If you look at the Arctic Ocean, uh, this is the extent of the ice, uh, uh, let's see, in September 1979 uh, to 2000 and September 2005. You could see that area here now already is open waters and it's headed into becoming open waters in which you can uh, uh, basically uh, 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 get the ship to uh, move in open waters, not on ice uh, from Europe here, Northern Europe. This is Alaska here. Uh, Alaska is here. Uh, this is now Asia uh, 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 to uh, North America. So the, uh, the uh, Arctic Ocean is melting, providing fresh water supplies to uh, the North Atlantic uh, in general. There have been uh, uh, many uh, climatic shifts in the past. Uh, the uh, observation on Earth is that uh, the carbon dioxide uh, uh, concentration in parts per million uh, uh, of the atmosphere have been documented. And you could see here different observations at Pound Barrow in Alaska, uh, uh, flights uh, by the Swedes uh, in airplanes, uh, sampling CO2 in the atmosphere uh, at the Hawaii on the Mauna Loa volcano and at the South Pole uh, observation sites. Uh, all of them uh, 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 basically agree that an, is an increase uh, of the carbon dioxide atmosphere uh, in the uh, atmosphere. And this uh, later uh, observation are shown here. Uh, this is designated as the uh, Keeling curve. Uh, notice that the carbon dioxide increases and then decreases according to the seasons and uh, in the upper hemisphere and the lower hemisphere. Uh, over the summer, uh, trees uh, are uh, undergoing the photosynthesis process. Uh, so in that case, uh, uh, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and agricultural uh, uh, activities, they decrease the carbon dioxide, but in the winter, carbon dioxide is released back to the atmosphere. And it's a relentless increase uh, to the point of the 400 parts per million that I used in the previous calculation in calculating the forcing uh, and the temperature increase that is expected from increasing the carbon dioxide in the uh, atmosphere. So in that case, definitely there is an anthropogenic effect and uh, uh, the amount of increase can be calculated uh, uh, the, in terms of what's called the, uh, the uh, in, in terms of the relative concentration uh, from 1958 to 1975, it was 327 parts per million minus 312 parts per million. So in that case, the increase has been 0.08 uh, or uh, 8 uh, uh, and uh, 0.04 0047 per year uh, increase in the concentration of carbon uh, dioxide. So the relative increase in concentration from the pre-industrial age to 1975, that was about 11% and it is continuing uh, in general. All right, so that's uh, established that humans have an effect. Uh, this is the CO2 in parts per million. Uh, in the year 1000, it was 280 here. Right now, it is reaching 350 or 400 uh, parts per uh, million. Okay, so this is the background. Uh, and uh, the suggestion is that uh, the global temperatures are increasing, uh, a temperature anomaly of about 0.5 degrees so far. If we reach the one degree, then we'll start uh, worrying. Uh, the uh, release, the absorption of uh, energy in the atmosphere by the presence of CO2 is shown by the change in temperature, delta Gs, uh, according to the concentration of uh, CO2. Here, if you double it, you triple it, you quadruple it, you quintuple it, there are two bands in the CO2 uh, uh, that absorb the spectrum 
of solar radiation, the infrared, uh, you'll find that if you double the carbon dioxide, I may give you an assignment just to figure it out for yourself, you'll find that the weak bands contribute about, uh, let's say, 0.3 degrees here, increase in temperature. And the five micrometer bands are the ones that contribute the most, about uh, uh, one and a half degrees uh, uh, Celsius. And that's uh, where we are reaching now in terms of doubling or tripling the carbon dioxide formation. All right, we have enough data here to do some uh, prediction about what would be uh, the uh, effects of increasing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And uh, we can build a model that I'll show you how uh, we try to do that here ourselves. Uh, we looked at the uh, atmosphere uh, of the Earth. You'll find that uh, the temperature near the uh, Earth's surface is, of course, uh, 20 degrees uh, Celsius uh, uh, or 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, that we uh, uh, that's 20 in Celsius and about uh, 50 or 60 uh, Fahrenheit. You find that the temperature decreases as you go up to the troposphere, and the troposphere is the area of the atmosphere where the weather phenomena occur. Then it stays almost like a constant and starts increasing again into the stratosphere. And that's uh, where now you find that the air uh, uh, in the atmosphere is very, very uh, light. Uh, then you go to the mesosphere and the thermosphere where the air concentration is very low. But the troposphere is where the weather phenomena are being formed. And if you look in the summer right now up to the sky and you look at the cumulus nimbus clouds, you find that they're rising. Uh, uh, and as they rise, they, uh, they look very nice. But the weather phenomena are primarily formed in the troposphere at a height of about uh, 10 kilometers. So this is the active region of the Earth where the weather phenomena, tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, storms, or even droughts and uh, rain events are uh, formed. So let us uh, take uh, a model of the uh, atmosphere uh, up to the troposphere, and let's see if we can uh, uh, do some prediction of uh, what would be an increase in the carbon dioxide uh, have an effect on uh, the Earth's surface. So let us go to the uh, troposphere. Uh, this is the surface of the Earth. That's the temperature in Kelvins. Uh, and uh, it, Kelvins is 273 plus uh, degrees Celsius. You could see here that uh, according to the IAEA bulletin, I think it's uh, 2000 and uh, maybe uh, 1973, uh, a long time ago, the prediction was that uh, you can, uh, if you double the carbon dioxide, according to that curve that I've shown you earlier, from 150 parts per million per volume, uh, if you double it, you'll find that you can increase the temperature of the Earth by about two degrees. And if you quadruple it from 150 to 600, you can increase it another uh, two degrees. So this is close to the Earth's surface, but uh, you'll find that the temperature now has a slope, a gradient, to the troposphere here at 12 kilometers in height where the weather phenomena are formed. And then it keeps going up, but now uh, you'll find that the curves reverse because it's a constant amount of energy coming to us from the sun. So what is caught near the surface of the earth is lost from the above the troposphere and it cools uh, down. So we took uh, that uh, measurement uh, here and uh, produced uh, that simple linear model to predict what happens if the slope of that curve, the, uh, where energy is uh, moved from uh, the uh, troposphere to the Earth's surface and from uh, the uh, troposphere to the above uh, the troposphere in altitude in kilometers, if the slope changes, how does that affect the heat transfer? And we know, according to Fourier laws of conduction, that the, uh, the Heat flux is proportional to the gradient of uh, the temperature. So this is a linear, simple linear model. This is T sub M uh, at the height R, that the temperature at the troposphere, where the weather phenomena are being made. And we suggest that uh, uh, if you uh, uh, double or quadruple 
the, uh, the uh, concentration of the CO2, then here is the temperature changes by delta T here and another delta T. Now, if you have a, a slope that is uh, 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 some kind of uh, uh, the, uh, this is a slope of the temperature from the surface of the Earth to the uh, troposphere. And uh, if you increase the temperature, this means that your slope is uh, more, uh, 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 a higher slope as a matter of fact, in that case, you'll find that you, you have a heat flux from the surface of the Earth to the troposphere. On the other hand, at the upper layer above the troposphere, uh, the slope changes uh, with heat now moving from above the troposphere to the troposphere area itself. So you have two uh, competing heat fluxes, one uh, from the Earth that has uh, heated up as a result of uh, uh, higher uh, concentrations of CO2, the greenhouse effect, is close to the Earth's surface, uh, competing with another heat flux coming from the upper uh, atmosphere to the area uh, where the weather phenomena are being done. All right, so we create here an analytical model. Uh, we basically are solving the heat transfer equation uh, in a one dimensional model. In that case, ignores the curvature of the Earth, and uh, you have to solve the uh, uh, Laplace equation or the conduction equation for heat transfer as a function of height. So we tried that and that's what we get. Uh, you, uh, uh, the equation applies at the lower uh, temp uh, region one as well as in the upper region uh, two above the troposphere. We set a boundary condition that uh, near the Earth's surface, uh, at, at the, sorry, at the, uh, at the, Troposphere, the temperature is uh, at uh, height R is T sub M. At zero, at the Earth's surface, we call it T sub S for surface. And uh, uh, above, the, at, uh, above the troposphere, we write it as T at R plus S. We call it that T in the upper atmosphere. Now, we solve the heat conduction equation by integrating the, uh, uh, the Laplacian here uh, twice. In that case, we add two constants of integration, C1, for the first integration and C2 for the second integration. The first integration gives us a constant uh, C1. When you integrate the, uh, D, D, uh, the differential of temperature as a function of Z, you get another constant of integration C2, but you get a straight line here for the temperature distribution. So it is a, a, a linear kind of a solution where uh, you get uh, a uh, temperature distribution in the lower uh, 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 below the uh, below the troposphere and the temperature distribution above the uh, uh, troposphere. So in that case, uh, we have uh, two temperature distributions. We uh, apply the constant of integration, and we get basically two temperature distributions: one above the troposphere and one below the troposphere. Uh, so this is a temperature distribution in the region uh, two. Uh, all right, but uh, that doesn't give us any information about the temperature because we don't know the boundary conditions. So in that case, we concentrate our attention on the heat flux. And according to Fourier's law of conduction, the heat flux as a vector is minus K, the conductivity of any material uh, multiplied uh, by the area. Uh, multiplied into the gradient or the slope in that case of the temperature distribution. And I suggested that that slope varies uh, depending on uh, whether you are above the troposphere or below the troposphere. So this is fortunate because we don't know what is the conductivity of the atmosphere. We don't even know the area of uh, the uh, heat transfer process. So in that case, we can eliminate K and A if we take ratios of the heat fluxes and eliminate that K and that A. All right, so in that case, we calculate the heat flux uh, in the lower region. We calculate the heat flux uh, minus K dZ, the gradient of the temperature above the uh, troposphere. And then in that case, we get a net heat flux. Still, we have the conductivity and the capital A right here. So instead of calculating the uh, 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 net heat flux, we calculate the relative uh, heat flux. We take, take that net skews uh, the flux to the upper from the lower uh, uh, atmosphere below the troposphere minus the flux 
coming to the higher atmosphere relative to some reference value and we take it as a flux at the lower atmosphere. And uh, in that case, uh, we can take now numerical values, say, let's say it's 13 kilometers. Uh, let's take the S, the height of the above the troposphere, 27 kilometers. And uh, let's say that the temperature in the troposphere, according to uh, um, uh, measurements uh, of satellites, is uh, lower than uh, 273, it's 200 degrees uh, Kelvin. So in that case, uh, we can uh, eliminate uh, needing to know the conductivity. It's a very smart way of parameterizing our uh, solution. We take the value of the net heat from the Earth's surface to the troposphere minus the net heat flux from above the troposphere to the troposphere relative to the reference value that cancels the K and the A. And here we can start now using <coughs> some numbers to estimate the heat flux to the troposphere. Let's start with 150 parts per million before the industrial revolution, and let's double it to 300 parts per million. That's what we have now. You'll find that the surface temperature increases by two degrees. You'll find that the upper level temperature is 269, uh, and uh, if you double it, it becomes 253 decreases. Uh, the temperature gradient in the lower atmosphere uh, is uh, say 554. If you double the carbon dioxide, you increase it to 565, and the temperature gradient uh, 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 at 150 parts per million, 219, uh, when you double the carbon dioxide, it's 159. So in that case, you can got here now substitute those numbers here uh, for the heat fluxes in the upper atmosphere and the lower atmosphere. We derive the equations for them here. And uh, K and A cancel out in the relative values. And you find that you get, uh, in the case of 150 parts per million, a net heat flux of 3.35. Uh, if you double the, uh, the carbon dioxide concentration, it becomes 4.1, which means that there is a relative increase of 22% in the heat flux to the troposphere where the weather phenomena are made. And uh, that suggests basically that if you increase the temperature of the Earth by two degrees, by doubling the carbon dioxide concentration near the Earth's surface, the greenhouse effect, you increase the uh, severity or the heat fluxes of all weather phenomena, whether it's a hurricane or a drought or, a, uh, or uh, 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 tornadoes or rain events by 22%. And you could see here, if you quadruple that 150 into 600, uh, the surface temperature decreases by another two degrees. And you'll find that the severity of the heat, net heat flux to the troposphere is now 40% instead of 22%. And the prediction here is that as you increase the carbon dioxide, the severity of the weather phenomena will become more severe. And that work was done uh, 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 several years ago, I can show you the paper that was published in a conference about it. And it is a prediction that is, even though it does not consider convection, it doesn't need a supercomputer in that case. It's a simple calculation based on actual data that uh, it is a prediction that as we increase the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the severity of the weather phenomena are going to go and become much more serious. And we see it happening today. So in that case, uh, on, a, on a graph here that is generated from those results, these are our own results, by the way, they're not taken from, uh, they are not uh, uh, other people results, these are our own. You'll find that the relative increase uh, in the net heat flux goes from 3.4, say, by doubling and then quadrupling. And the relative increase here uh, increases here to 22%. If you double it, uh, the existing concentration of uh, carbon dioxide and, and then you go to 40% increase in the weather phenomena. And uh, if I take simply, for instance, an increase in the intensity of rain events, oh, we could see that happening in the news. Uh, excessive flooding in areas of the country that never happened before, never happened before, so in, indeed, we are at that 20% here. And we don't want to reach that 40% because in that case, you can think about uh, the heavy rain events washing 
the topsoil and turning our agricultural land into a dust bowl back again. And in that case, human life cannot continue on earth if we destroy our crop land uh, in general. So you'll find that uh, it has to do with the temperature gradient, a very simple uh, conduction model. It's approximate, obviously, but then we don't need a supercomputer uh, to uh, increase uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, when uh, that work was done, definitely, uh, since it was done and published, I can show you a paper that I can, I'll give you a paper to just read and write a small, uh, a small summary of it. Uh, there was a prediction that uh, uh, hurricane frequency intensity uh, should be expected. And indeed, uh, the severity of weather phenomena is a fact of life. Hurricanes can be very, very destructive. This is what happens to our homes uh, and people get displaced uh, uh, and all the uh, effects of it. Uh, as I suggested uh, for the North European uh, uh, nations, uh, the higher uh, uh, temperature uh, would reverse. Uh, they're worried about a reversal of the current that uh, keeps uh, England and Europe uh, warm. Uh, and uh, if that uh, process is reversed, uh, Europe can get into a mini ice age. That's paradoxical uh, in that case. Some people suggest that 30 million years ago, we had the mammoths uh, in Siberia. Uh, now we don't have uh, 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 the mammoths. And the suggestion is that uh, the uh, frozen mammoths had uh, uh, green plants in their stomachs. And that means that the effect happened in a very, very sudden way. So that can explain the, the graph that I have shown you earlier that we generated earlier, where you have a sudden uh, decrease in the temperature uh, of uh, the Earth in general. So the cooling uh, happens in a uh, very sharp, uh, fast uh, way. All right, so in that case, we can, uh, it becomes a max extinction kind of risk to human civilization in general if we allow the process to go uh, unchecked. And as I suggested, the uh, geographical aspects of the temperature uh, variations from the distance of the sun, uh, the earth from the sun, uh, we don't have control on this, but we can adapt to it. But the increase in temperature and the change in the climate due to anthropogenic uh, activities like our own activities, uh, it is really our responsibility to try to uh, uh, modify what uh, uh, we uh, have uh, uh, done there. What? Okay. So in that case, uh, let's say uh, uh, that is uh, a prediction, and uh, definitely uh, it is uh, incumbent and for civilization on Earth to continue and not uh, extinct our industrial uh, civilization or technological civilization uh, and reach the level one, hopefully, for humanity on the Kardashev scale of level one of civilization. So what if uh, not, nothing is done about uh, controlling uh, the CO2 uh, concentrations? Uh, well, uh, if we get a, uh, a, globe, uh, a, a, a global, meaning global on Earth, effect of a runaway kind of heating, uh, there is a suggestion to restore the condition that existed, existed 30 million years ago. As I suggested, the Earth's climate uh, was a very temperate, nice climate. Uh, Antarctica was uh, land, open land. Uh, however, the distribution of temperature uh, that led to that mild climate was the connection between the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And uh, the closest that the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean are uh, to each other is, as we know, the Panama Canal. Uh, is there a way for us to connect, reconnect, the, the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, uh, uh, like uh, through the Panama uh, Canal. We cannot do it through the Panama Canal because the Panama Canal is a system of uh, uh, locks and dams. You could see here ships coming in here. They go into a lock. The lock is filled with water. The water rises, and then it goes into a, uh, a, a lake, a Lake Gatun. So in that case, the sea levels of uh, 
the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean are not at the same level. The uh, ships are raised in a lock and dev system going through Lake Gatun and then uh, lowered back into the Pacific Ocean or vice versa. So this is the elevation of the Panama Canal. You could see one, two, three locks and dams here where ships are raised, placed into Lake Gatun. Uh, and then uh, here is an area that had to be excavated uh, by the United States and Panama, and then lowered back again at the Pacific Ocean. So that connection between the Pacific and the uh, uh, ocean and the Atlantic Ocean has disappeared uh, because of a lower level of water in the oceans uh, uh, in general. So if we want to reestablish this uh, 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 level uh, connection between the two oceans and return the condition on Earth of 30 million years ago, uh, we need to uh, connect the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean on a sea level canal. And here we invoke nuclear civil engineering. And uh, this is a, an idea that was uh, suggested uh, as part of the uh, as part of the plowshare program uh, in building a sea level canal. These are different locations for the possible uh, connections of connect reconnecting back again the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. And uh, in that case, we can reach conditions uh, of uh, uh, temp a temperate climate and avoid through, uh, this is named also terraforming uh, or uh, 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 global basically uh, engineering uh, by exploding uh, several uh, nuclear devices, thermonuclear devices in the megaton level in a row. If you do this, you create a crater along the level of the canal uh, where ships can also uh, connect uh, uh, the sail between the Atlantic and the Pacific and the water would flow from one ocean to the other. There is in fact a 20 centimeter measured uh, difference in the level of the water between one ocean to the other, but then that restores the conditions of 30 million years ago. There have been experiments on excavation. This is a, a nuclear device at uh, uh, 35 kiloton uh, uh, TNT equivalent uh, charge uh, in basalt rock. So it can really uh, dig for you a, a, a crater for a port, maybe a whole port uh, 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 in basalt uh, rock, uh, or it can be in uh, sand. Uh, this is uh, an experiment carried out uh, in terms of cratering. Look here, these are really uh, trucks here. You could see the size of it. This was called the Sedan Crater, a 100 kiloton uh, explosive charge as an experiment. If you uh, explode those devices in a row, you could see here that you can create a, a sea level canal between the Pacific and the uh, Atlantic. Uh, of course, uh, this means that we have to uh, design those devices uh, if we, uh, uh, hopefully we don't have to use this, uh, but if we get the runaway kind of heating, uh, like, uh, and then uh, uh, extinction of the technology, our technological civilization is threatened, we may have to do it uh, 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 in a compelled type of uh, way. Uh, the design uh, would include, of course, uh, nuclear engineering type of applications. You have to think about the radiation that could be released. And obviously the country that would allow that project to go on uh, would be uh, uh, rewarded for uh, uh, its contribution. Uh, the radioactive isotopes that would be produced are listed in that table right here. Here, uh, primarily sodium 24, phosphorus uh, 32, not as a half-life here. These are very short half-lives. So they are generated and then they disappear within a very short time. Uh, some of them will remain for a few years, like iron 55, 2.7 years have life. But all the other isotopes that can be produced are really hours and days and they all disappear except for iron 55. And uh, in that case, uh, uh, this could be a, uh, a savior in general. We can uh, dig that canal using conventional methods, but uh, here, uh, uh, the cost of using nuclear uh, explosives uh, in a nuclear civil engineering approach 
uh, much would be much cheaper than if you use conventional digging device for a sea level canal. And in fact, they could not dig a sea level canal. The course would have been prohibitive. So what we have now is a lock and dam system connecting the Pacific <coughs> to the uh, Atlantic oceans in the Panama Canal. Uh, let me uh, suggest that there are people thinking about how to reduce CO2 uh, in the atmosphere and uh, cooling the earth in case we get some uh, global uh, climatic uh, warming. Uh, this would be an artificial tree that would concentrate CO2 from the atmosphere. People thought about this idea. Uh, there is an idea about cloud seeding. Uh, this is a design actually published in the uh, uh, in the British uh, uh, Academy of Science uh, 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 publications, and it would be a, a, a wind turbine. The turbine here is called the Flettner uh, rotor turbine. Uh, as uh, as a ship here uh, moves, uh, if you rotate those uh, turbines here, it provides you me mechanical power to have ships that would roam through the oceans pumping water uh, and uh, into the atmosphere, generating low-lying clouds. Uh, and that those low-lying clouds are thought to create an albedo uh, reflecting the sun, sun's radiation. Some people thought about uh, 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 seeding the oceans with iron to increase the, uh, for the concentration of uh, carbon dioxide in the algae in the oceans. Uh, some people suggested even having mylar sheets sent up in the upper atmosphere uh, to reflect solar radiation. Very many, many ideas are proposed, but uh, our contribution is the idea of a sea level canal. Uh, you would think also about uh, 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 cooling towers of nuclear uh, power stations, of course, generating low lying uh, clouds too. So there are many, many ideas uh, floating uh, around about uh, 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 how to deal with the runaway uh, cool uh, heating of the Earth's uh, atmosphere. Uh, the efforts continue in uh, different ways. Of course, you heard about the, uh, the uh, Kyoto Protocol. Uh, different conferences are held every few years, like uh, the latest was the Paris Climate Change agreement that suggests that we don't want, uh, we want to limit the increase in the temperature of the earth to these two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial uh, level. Uh, the dislocations are happening and they're real. Uh, it is very sobering to see pictures uh, of uh, basically whole nations. Uh, the Tuvulu Island, for instance, is disappearing uh, because the increase in temperature is uh, 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 expanding the water in the oceans. So it is drowning the island. So a whole population has to be relocated here. Uh, we know that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this is the present day shoreline of the earth. If we don't do it ourselves uh, in reducing uh, carbon or controlling carbon uh, dioxide emissions or reconnecting the Pacific uh, uh, ocean to the Atlantic Ocean, as I'm suggesting, this would be what nature does to us. This would be uh, all of Florida, all of New Orleans, uh, other cities in the world uh, would be submerged under water. So if we don't do it ourselves, nature will do it itself, but at the expense of great dislocations uh, to uh, people in general. And uh, the observation is that it is happening. This is uh, a uh, highway, I think, uh, 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 a highway in Florida. And you could see here uh, Fort Lauderdale uh, Highway, uh, State Road 1A1 in 2013, as a result of a king tide, the water taking over. Cities like Venice uh, get flooded every once in a while. They'll disappear also under uh, one meter uh, of uh, uh, water. Uh, the change in the climate is affecting directly many people. This is the city of paradise in California in 2019. The whole city was engulfed in, uh, uh, of course, in uh, uh, fires. Uh, we see the fires occurring here right now at the same time as we are having uh, flooding. 
uh, there could be other uh, suggestions. Some parts of the earth would become uninhabitable, like in India, uh, for instance, uh, Europe uh, could uh, fall into a situation of uh, global uh, a, uh, climatic change in the direction of a, uh, paradoxically of an ice age. And uh, this is the predictions of the solar activity up to 2040. And as I suggested uh, earlier, I suggested that uh, scientists are looking at those cycles that are uh, you know, geographic. And uh, when they combine them together, there is a prediction that we are headed into cooling, not heating. So uh, uh, the, uh, the, the knowledge is uh, very limited. And I invite you to uh, think about it. So these have been events of cooling here shown in the United States where, uh, however, we are also have uh, events of forming. This is the uh, highest temperature uh, on record, uh, uh, recorded at uh, Furnace Creek Visitor Center, 130 degrees Fahrenheit or 59 degrees uh, uh, Celsius. That happened uh, uh, in uh, uh, the, this is recently really uh, 2020, uh, picture taking on 2020. We see the dislocations uh, happening for the first time ever in recorded history. There was a hurricane uh, in the Mediterranean region here. You could see it affected Egypt and people died there from electrocution from the heavy rainfall. Uh, migration is happening. This is a Pulitzer uh, winning prize of uh, people in a boat migrating uh, through the Mediterranean uh, to Europe. Again, that's caused partially by uh, heating. Uh, people are leaving their homes desperate. And even here in the United States, you could see migration from the southern uh, 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 states of South America into uh, North America. So uh, global uh, climatic change can be uh, really uh, a, a, a source of dislocation, civil wars, uh, people uh, dislocating, leaving their homes. and. Uh, uh, we have to be aware of it. It is a fact. Some people suggest that uh, we build islands in the ocean where people would live on. Yes, the rich people, but how about the masses of people who cannot uh, do it? So in, in, uh, in essence, then, it is true that we have uh, geographical effects that we have no control on in terms of global climatic change, but there are also effects that we have a control on, and it's our responsibility to deal with the effect that we can control, particularly CO2 emissions. And uh, uh, in that case, it's uh, a duty for uh, the future engineers and scientists to address the issue. We cannot ignore it. Uh, the uh, geographical effects, uh, that is something that we have to adapt uh, to. Uh, I'll be happy to stay in the chat room, uh, but uh, 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 for any, questions. I'm sorry, I didn't catch you, uh, uh, so you are uh, co-hosting anyway. So I'll oh, speak, uh, uh, reduce that. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll stay in the chat room. Remember, we have only one class left to go, and then we'll have uh, this coming Friday, our final. It will cover a lecture on Wednesday and have a nice afternoon, everybody. I hope you can read all the material in the chapter. Uh, I have tried to cover as much of it as we, I could.